Yeah. Hello, right? everyone. 18,000 people are just singing songs. Artist communities Hello, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, before we get started, I want to take a moment to offer up a land acknowledgement. I want to acknowledge that wherever we are currently located on Turtle Island, otherwise known as North America, we are on occupied territory. Art New York's membership in the five boroughs of New York City operates on the unceded ancestral land of the Lenape, the Wappinger, Canarsie, Rockaway, and Matinecock communities. I want to honor and celebrate all of these indigenous communities, their elders past and present, as well as future generations. I also want to take this time to acknowledge that after there was stolen land, there were stolen people. And I want to honor the generations of displaced and enslaved people that built and continue to build the country that we occupy today. Thank you so much. My name is David Shane. My pronouns are he, him, his. I am the Director of Program Services here at Art New York, and I'm thrilled um, to have you here in the room, uh, and for those of you who are streaming with us online via HowlRound. A uh, brief visual description, I am a white man in my late 30s. I have light, dark hair. I have a short brown beard. Um, I'm wearing some maroon pants, a white shirt, and a, a dark blue blazer. I am going to uh, let our esteemed panelists introduce themselves. Um, when you do, I would ask you to tell us your name, your pronouns, uh, an organization that you are representing here today. And then I'd also love it if you would share with us uh, one show that you have seen recently that is sticking with you. Um, I, my show recently it, that I saw was uh, called Camp Manapia. Uh, and Uh, a new play that they're workshopping, and if you get a chance to see it, I recommend it. I'll turn it over to you. Hello, my name is Allie Blunt. Um, I am a white woman in my exactly mid 30s, as of a week ago. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I am, oh, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am wearing a silvery shirt and black pants. Um, I'm with Capacity Interactive, I don't remember if I said that already. Did I hit all the things? And your show. Your show. Um, and my show, so I have a one-year-old and a three-year-old at home, so I don't get to see like as much theater as I used to before they existed. Uh, so mine's a little further back, and I'm going to choose Parade, uh, which is the recent Broadway production, because it's one of my all-time favorite musicals, and I had been dying to see like a really solid professional production of it since I first heard the score. So that was very, very exciting to see such an incredible production of it. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Brian Joseph Lee. I use he pronouns or any pronouns that with respect. Um, visual description, I am a black man with uh, black hair, full beard, bright smile, <laughs> <laughs> wearing a blue suit and white shirt. Uh, I am the founder of Center Arts. Center Arts is a creative agency that centers artists, activists, and communities of color. We do that through strategic planning, uh, audience development, arts marketing, and community engagement initiatives. Um, What's what show? It? What show? The show's sticking with you. The show that's sticking with me right now is fantastic. It's called Prey uh, by our friends <laughs> at Ars Nova. Fernando knows it well. Uh, <laughs> Co-produced by the National Black Theater. Uh, written, conceived, created by a fantastic artist. Their name is Nikki Douglas. You should know them. But it's a fantastic ritual that centers black women and femmes through the lens of spirituality. Hi everyone, I'm Tom O'Connor. I use the He series. Um, I am a early 40s white bald man, who everybody thinks is much older than that. Uh, and uh, I'm wearing a black shirt and a gray blazer, jeans and black boots. Um, I run a company called Tom O'Connor Consulting Group. We do a variety of things, including executive search for the arts uh, with a specialty in uh, fundraising and marketing, but as well as executive leadership, artistic and managing. Uh, we also have a division for marketing consulting and for strategic planning. So we work with organizations across the U.S. and in Australia uh, of all different uh, genres. So we work with theaters, but we also work with classical music, opera, dance, performing arts centers, all sorts of different things. I'm also trained as a social worker, so I talk about that a little bit as I talk about my approach to marketing. But I'm very glad to be on this panel with old friends. So. Oh, my show. Um, just last week, I saw Pearly Victorious, and it's amazing. It, and it's, it's like it could have been written yesterday, unfortunately. Uh, but it's really incredible if you haven't seen it yet. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Beth Prevor. She, her pronouns. 
I am a white mature woman with short gray hair, yeah. wearing kind of clear glasses, um, black jeans, white shirt, and I think that's my visual. Um, I run uh, hands-on sign interpretive performances. We do sign interpretive performances, I guess that's in the title. Um, I, I actually haven't seen anything here recently. I did the <laughs> parade, um, but I saw a production in London of Dr. Semmelweis with Mark Rylance, which was yeah. amazing. And I hope they bring it to New York. It was wonderful. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Fernando Masterson. I use he and his pronouns. I am the marketing director at Ars Nova. Um, uh, visual description, I am a, a Latina man wearing a like blue plaid situation, uh, <laughs> uh, a black hair, uh, very dirty white shoes, I am now realizing, so my mom would <laughs> hate how dirty these shoes are. That's New York. Um, and a little bit about a show that I'm going to say the answer that I shared with y'all right before this. And I am totally an amper stan, I think is what they're called. Whoever came up with that at AKA is a genius. And Juliet, I have, I have seen it like six times. Uh, <laughs> Judgment Free Zone, I've seen it six times. I'm obsessed with the show. Good. What are they called again? Amper, amper Stan, because it's like Amber and Juliet. Stan. Whoever at AKA like, really came up with that, like, please get a raise. Like, this is amazing. Um, yeah. and, we're, and we're done here. And we're done. <laughs> <laughs> That's marketing. That's all you need to know about marketing. You've learned. Um, yeah, very big fan of Anne Juliet. And also just to like, give some love on the off-Broadway space and kind of there are some parallels to Anne, you know, with Anne Juliet. Uh, Mary Gets Hers, mm -hmm. that was done at Playwrights Horizons a few, I guess, I think it wrapped a few weeks ago, was spectacular, so spectacular. Um, Playwrights Realm, right? Uh, it was, sorry, yes, it was Playwrights Realm. Yeah. We love all the Playwrights. Yes, we love all the Playwrights <laughs> things, but uh, Mary Gets Hers, spectacular. We loved it. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Uh, so, we're going to get started. Let's, let's get going here. So, I think that, you know, it is, will not come as a surprise to any of you or to anyone uh, in the audience that there's a lot of uncertainty in the theatrical field right now. And I think one of the things that folks are wondering is whether or not what they're experiencing is something unique to them, something that's unique happening in their organization, or whether what they're experiencing is actually part of a larger sort of new normal, if that's actually a thing that we can say. Um, so I, I wonder if we can start by asking anybody who wants to, to share what trends you're observing, what, what's sort of happening out there, and maybe we'll center our conversation around some shared understanding of what really is happening in terms of, of marketing and audience development um, broadly in the field. So I asked Ali to start off to give us some insights um, and some data that you have from Capacity Interactive. Yes, I'd be happy to. So the data I'm going to share um, is actually unpublished. As of right now, it will be soon. But um, it's a sneak preview of a talk that I'm giving on Friday at Capacity Interactive's boot camp conference with the advisory board for the arts. Um, with their permission, they said I could share it here. So you guys get a sneak preview of the sneak preview, <laughs> which is exciting. Um, so just kind of some baseline numbers. Um, it's kind of a mixed bag right now. Um, let's start with subs. So subscriptions right now, we're seeing that there's roughly an average of like 72% renewal rate. Um, compared to the last full season before the pandemic, so that'd be the 1819 season. So, you know, not amazing, could be worse. Um, in a more optimistic note, the subs rate, um, about 23% of subs are actually new to file, which is a substantial number, um, which is honestly very exciting that about a quarter of subs are, are new people who have not subscribed before. Um, looking at single tickets, about 50% on average of single ticket buyers were new to file. Um, and then looking at paid house, uh, going back to 1819, so less full pre-pandemic season, um, we were looking at roughly 70% for paid house. That dipped in 21-22 all the way down to 57%. And actually, as of last season, it went back up to 66%. So we are not quite where we were in 1819, but we actually are seeing some improvement. Um, the kind of headline is that audiences really kind of are where they're going to be. Like we're, the, the audiences that have returned are really what we expect to have returned. Um, and this isn't surprising to us because honestly, even pre-pandemic, even setting that aside, audiences were on the decline. This is a trend that's going back way before that. You, if you look at data, it kind of is just like a steady, steady downhill. So it is exciting that between 21, 22 and 22, 23 that we did see some improvement, um, but it is definitely on the decline overall, big picture. So like I said, kind of mixed out there. 
Can you tell us a little bit about the types of organizations that you're referring to in, in this data set? Yes, so that data set is based on ABA's study of 50 organizations. Those were all of the arts, but a good number of them were theaters. And this is really the trend that we're seeing specifically for theaters too. Like, you know, we're kind of seeing roughly ballpark similar things across genres. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Um, does anybody else have any trends that you're observing that you want to share? I'll just jump in and say that um, our client base is pretty broad in terms of budget scale and genre, as I mentioned before. But um, I think the, the one sort of correlation we can point to or that we can put our finger on in terms of perhaps the slower to return or the slower to rebuild audiences is has a lot to do with, uh, with uh, let's call it proximity to risk uh, in terms of the, the artistic program. You know, there's a lot of institutions that whose very mission is tied to doing work that is lesser known, that is newer, and that, that represents more of a risk to, to audience members um, that are coming back slower. They're just seeing, they're having a tougher time getting folks over the line. Whereas our clients that are doing more what you might call mainstream fare, musicals, things of that nature, um, not surprising, are, are having a slightly easier time. Um, I don't think any of that is groundbreaking, but I think that it's leading to a, a lot of conversation among our clients around um, a new conversation between marketing and audiences and artistic programming, which I hope we'll talk a lot more about today. Mm -hmm. um, but that's that's really what we're uh, what we're seeing. That's what we're seeing um, across. I capacity interactive. I don't think I said is we're a digital marketing consulting firm for the arts. Um, for me specifically, I'm a consultant there, and my clients are exclusively theaters. It's my background is a theater. I worked at the Huntington and Roundabout. Um, so anecdotally, I can say that that's very much what we're seeing. It's really fascinating to hear from my clients that when you do like a big name blockbuster, like I remember a chorus line, we like ended that campaign early because sales were so incredible, but then you know those smaller, newer, lesser known plays are of course not seeing those results. So it's, it, it's not dissimilar to what you would expect even pre-pandemic, but I think it really has exacerbated and we're really seeing such a stark contrast between like blockbuster shows mm. and other. Mm. I know I just spoke, but I just wanna say one quick thing to add on to the data that you referenced before and that Talking about that churn of folks who aren't coming, or, or the ratio of people who are new to file and who are new in the audience, I feel like you know, for anybody who's spent a, more years than they care to admit looking at this kind of data um, in, in terms of audiences returning, churning, all that kind of thing, what strikes me and what we've seen both in the data you're referencing and in other similar studies is that um, what is distinguishing about this period is that we have audiences that have been not completely deactivated for several years, but have been not as active. And so when you're thinking about a small percentage of audiences, generally speaking, returning year over year to institutions, you're now in a period where you're trying to reboot a, a machine after you know, a shutdown um, that is just in a different place. So said slightly differently, if you're trying to sell subscriptions um, to a single ticket buyer and you have not had single ticket buyers for two years, um, it stands to reason that it's going to take a few years for that engine to fully rev back up. And mm. so it's. Just there's a there's a downstream effect of all of the things we're seeing in terms of single tickets. Yeah, I, I am curious to know in like the the subscription conversation because we're obviously actively interrogating what <laughs> subscriptions and membership look like. Mm -hmm. Do you does this data have any insight on like fixed versus flex? I, I imagine okay, because I I am right now. something that I'm like observing is you know just in like audience trends is this feeling of. Uh, wanting control and yes. uh, that you know long gone to the days of I need to go to this show on this day yeah. and I value that consistency you could get sick at any moment anything could happen you know mm. um, so I have that, that's something and also I, I, I will give a plug for capacity interactives podcast because I listened to all of them and I know that was yeah. a conversation <laughs> that came up recently but it was I was curious if that popped up in your in your data but yeah the ABA study did not break it down by subs types um, but I can very much affirm what you're saying that audiences want flexibility and even at CI because we um, all the consultants we all talk amongst ourselves and share data and you know anecdotes and everything about our clients um, and very much the organizations that have flexibility and you know not a fixed package definitely are seeing better results than those who have fixed packages for sure I think the one thing I can add as like sitting somewhere in between the data-driven analysis and the civic and community-oriented programming, mm -hmm. is that none of this change is happening in isolation. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so we have, you know, yes, a pandemic that stopped us from having public audiences and moving forward, uh, nested within a conversation about racial reckoning, nested within a sea change of artistic and executive leadership. Uh, you can't change a leader of an organization without shifting literally everything about that organization, right? So that goes down to what is programmed, who the supporters are, who your core audiences is or imagines themselves to be. Uh, and so a lot of the conversation anecdotally that I'm seeing with clients around the country um, 
is really about like, uh, you know, if there is success or not, sort of what to attribute the success to, right? Mm. So whether we do see that like blockbuster shows, which I don't parallel with any, you know, anything other than spectacle, actually. Uh, Course Line is a great example, but you know, your dusty old, um, <laughs> insert, you know, American stalwart here. <laughs> uh, I have not seen in my anecdotal evidence selling any better or worse than your new adventurous show that is written by, of, or for a specific community, right? Mm -hmm. So spectacle, yes, in terms of entertainment and scope and scale, but that doesn't equate to traditional or not. Um, it also doesn't parallel any sort of like core audience that, that imagined themselves at a theater before a specific change had occurred there. So, you know, if you are comparing sales data before a pandemic with one artistic director to sales data during and post pandemic with a different artistic director, those are not apples to apples, right? And so I do think that this conversation ripples very quickly beyond the numbers and into specifically what are we doing to maintain relevance within our communities and make the case for why people should support us even through significant changes that are happening. I think this concept about, you know, you, you change a leader at an organization, everything changes, is really interesting because for me, I actually think, I, I find it really optimistic to think about the opportunity that's there, right? It, the changes don't take place overnight and it takes a while for them to like take hold and do things, but there's a lot of opportunity, I think, in that change. Mm -hmm. You would hope so, yeah. I mean, I, I think so too. I mm -hmm. think that, you know, unfortunately, if a certain theater company regionally or in New York is doing better or worse, people will want to extrapolate that to, well, what's the agenda, right? Mm -hmm. What's the mission? Who's the person programming? And I think it's interesting, we'll probably touch on this, it's like, where do you want to lay that blame? Because a prevailing narrative that is starting to emerge is that certain organizations have shifted too fast or become too woke or have forgotten about their core audiences and are moving too quickly. And so a lot of your traditional either funders or ticket buyers or subscribers would rather pack up their toys and go rather than sort of see that change through. I don't necessarily think it's that simple, yeah. right? But um, optimism, I think there's a case for, right? I think it's unfortunate that the time frame by which we are uh, assessing the tenures of new leaders, particularly leaders of color, but not exclusively, um, being in relation to the pandemic and the shutdown and the return, I think it's a really unfortunate time to be assessing anybody's effectiveness. As somebody who does execu executive search and talks to boards all day mm -hmm. about trend, to, you know, turns in leadership and changes in direction for an organization, um, to, to grade anyone on that curve is very hard. And to the point of, of what Brian's saying, you know, the, uh, you know, let's just call it the attribution of the challenges that we're having right now. You know, looking at a show that's not selling, if we looked at that same show five years ago under the same, under a different leader, we might have very well just said, play just wasn't that good. Play just wasn't that good. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, that's, and that's frankly sometimes true. We all know that. It's, it's not, what's, what's the saying? It's not art if there isn't a risk that it's a total d disaster, you know, all that kind of thing. We have to have that sort of risk-taking appetite in this business. Um, but now we are so quick to try to attach that to an identity. Are so quick to attach that to somebody's, you know, uh, sensibility that it's really unfortunate to see. So, I will just say, somebody with wearing many hats up here, uh, who is both in the business of finding and supporting new leaders, um, that's something that I'm talking to boards about all the time. Is how that how they're funding and seeking support for that transition. So, but that's off topic of our panel. I guess. And yet, but such a good topic that we have a whole other panel on. <laughs> yeah. um, maybe we will. See you in the spring. Um, <laughs> so, you know, th this isn't, uh, I think that what we've heard about trends so far has a lot of optimism. Um, has, I find it really grounding actually to think about like, the, it's not great, right? But the downward trend, I find grounding because I think that that sort of indicates to me that the things that we might think about addressing aren't about like a bounce back from 2020. Yeah. It's yeah. like we were already headed in that direction. And so we can, we can look at a longer term to assess what we might change, right? I think that's actually really useful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think I was, I mean, in terms of our work, because we work with a specific community, I have either the luxury or not luxury of picking different shows from different theaters. Mm -hmm. So I, the tendency is to go to, you know, as somebody who's kind of thinking that they're somewhat of a producer, and what's going to sell, I mean, I have the luxury of going, when New York Theatre Workshop said, we'd like to do a show, going, I'd like to pick Merrily Roll mm -hmm. on as the show. Wouldn't and, everyone. Right. Well, and, and that's what they pick. I mean, so, so 
the, the interesting thing, I think, for us is even in the last two years, we've been incredibly busy in terms of access uh, issues and haven't seen theaters kind of pull back on that, which I guess was you know, a thought that was probably going to happen after the pandemic with budgets and you know, all, the, all the stuff that's going on with theaters. But I haven't seen that, which I thought was an interesting trend okay. for us. And in terms of audiences, you know, we, we have the luxury of, of picking some kind of hot shows. And then we have other theaters that we work with where we don't have the opportunity to pick and choose. And I haven't even seen that as well. I mean, I, I've seen kind of consistent audiences. So it's been good so far. Great. I'll busy. say, like, we're gonna, I, I, I'm, and that's part of, like, I'm still chewing on the data that you provided because I'm like, <laughs> processing it in my brain. But, and, and to speak to what everyone on this panel, I think, is saying is that institutions, there is an exciting moment in kind of moving from the, you know, inch deep, mile wide mentality to, like, you know, inch wide, mile deep. I'm noticing that a lot of organizations are, you know, doubling down on their values and are, are retargeting to the consumers and the people that are, actively engaged and involved with their organization and there's there's exciting opportunity there because you know of course we all want to be in a growth mindset sometimes we need to sustain and we are i think in a little bit of a of a of an environment right now where sustaining is okay and um that you know from a, gen a revenue perspective we can actually generate a lot of revenue from communicating to the audiences that are invested in our organization and in our organization's values and in our organization's leadership and principles so uh like it, it, I was just kind of chewing on that. It's it's, I, I I totally agree, David. I think it's an ex it sounds like an exciting opportunity, and it sounds like there's some really great some great things happening in this. There's so much fun that. data too about investing institutionally and like your values and whatnot. I don't remember the exact numbers, but there's a lot of data out there that shows that doubling down on uh, in, in marketing your values actually has a lot of positive effect, mm -hmm. and that audiences, arts audiences, in fact, are clamoring for that, and they look at nonprofits. Non nonprofit arts organizations specifically as places where they should be hearing about values. And it's interesting because uh, high propensity arts buyers actually are in much more, in much higher numbers, registered voters. So there's definitely a correlation there between investing in your values, people who are actively looking for that, people who are active politically generally. Like that is our audience. Say it louder for the people in the yes. back. Yes. <laughs> so important. This is really interesting. So I mean, I wanted to, I, I shared some questions in advance to think about, and this was actually one of them was like, how do you, how would you advise someone to think about marketing their institution as opposed to this the specific show how do you think and so i am hearing that that's part of it mm -hmm. um does anybody want to expand on how you are thinking about that yeah. i i'll jump in that space yeah. i mean i so my background you know starting in marketing and regional organizations and actually moving to new york uh, to work with the public theater uh, as an artistic producer i sort of been on both sides of that equation right between the art and the business um, at the public, I was director of Public Forum, which is their platform that uh, sort of has conversation in and around the work, right? So it's where art, activism, and community collide. And what was wonderful about Public Forum, which is actually where Fernando and I met, we both were working on that together, um, it was really exciting to sort of produce work that was in direct conversation with the most urgent issues in the community. Um, I think that that has a lot to do with how I support organizations now with their institutional marketing and narrative around why they do what they do, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it is not uncommon that I will join an organization at a moment of either um, crisis or you know some other kind of major change. We're really knitting together that narrative of why we market, um, you know, our educational programs one way and our development initiatives another way and our artistic programming to subscribers one way but to single ticket buys next way. It's all about alignment, right? Mm -hmm. And so sort of being able to help organizations see that the common thread there is providing value of, by, and for your community, right? Creating art that really transforms our theaters into more civic institutions that can support all activity within a community, I think is part of the, the values-driven efforts that we're seeing in companies, right? Um, but it is harder than it looks, and I think we can all attest to that, that when you're in the machine of a, of a high-performing, like high-output arts organization that has so many different messages to maintain, um, you can create sort of disparate threads very quickly, mm -hmm. right? And so I think that when you talk about how do you market an institution, it is about values, but it's also about speaking from one common voice. Mm -hmm. Can I just add to that, that 
you know, so often, and I say this particularly to small institutions all the time, so often when we talk about the under-resourcing and undercapitalizing of institutions, we're talking about the inability to advertise enough. And, and so often this institutional marketing we're talking about is not done with advertising and press. Mm -hmm. It is done through relationship and experience. Mm -hmm. And so you know, the, the experience we can give in, an, in a space and the relationship we can have through our owned channels, things like our email and social channels and all of that, um, relatively inexpensive, but that is actually the way you build an institutional connection with, a, with an audience member. You know, there's, uh, I, I feel like so often, and, and as I mentioned, we work with organizations of, ver of varying scales. So for having this conversation with the Metropolitan Opera, it's very different than having it with WP Theater. You know, it's a, it's a very, it's, it just is a range. But um, the opportunity to talk about your values and to let people know who you are, and let people know who the humans are that are, that are putting on this work, that is the distinguishing factor, I think, in what I observed in the pandemic during shutdown, where you know, folks who hadn't been talking about who they were as an institution and were just expecting people to put that connect, make, sort of connect those dots between the shows they were doing, the institutions that were better about telling that story directly uh, were in a better place to seek support when everything got shut down. And I think that there was, there was a real need and a, and a real eye-opener for a lot of institutions to see that that was, that that was that where the opportunity was for, for contributed revenue, but also for backing the more risky shows, to say, well, how does this fit into our, this mission? How does this fit into this collection of values as a way to, to make your institution or your organization the star, quote unquote, when the, when the, pro, when the show does it, itself doesn't have one? Um, but uh, but you know, in, in, when we're counseling organizations on how to do that, it's generally not through a big expensive ad campaign. It's not through you know, investing in, an, in, a, in a pricey PR firm. It's about what is, who, who do you already have in your database, and how can you talk to them? Mm -hmm. And, and I, I just want to, like, I'm the, I guess I'm the disability accessibility person on the panel. But I, I Not do just want, that. But but no, 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 but, <laughs> More than that, Ben. But I, but I do want to say, too, that, you know, especially, you know, when you're talking about, like, service organizations that provide services for accessibility, mm -hmm. that suddenly we become kind of like the middle person, the direct contact. Mm -hmm. And it's always been incredibly important to me, you know, especially working originally at Roundabout or the public, theaters like that to just go, we are a program of Roundabout. We are a program of the public. We are yeah. not, you know, we might be hands-on and we might be the, the contact people that the community is probably most comfortable with, whether it's deafness or, you know, blind, low vision, whatever. You have that link to these communities, but it's so important to me, and it always has been, that it's the recognition that it's the program of Roundabout, mm -hmm. that it's Roundabout, that these audience members, and I, I will just kind of, t like a short story, when we did the, uh, John Lithgow's one-man show, mm -hmm. that, that he acknowledged that on stage, it, you know, during the show, introducing the interpreter and saying that this group of people in this audience are Roundabout subscribers. And that was so important, I think, mm -hmm. for the entire audience to hear, along with the deaf community that was part of that audience, that they're not, they're, they're not a hands-on audience. They're, they're part of Roundabout's community. And mm -hmm. so it, it becomes a little bit of a kind of a separation, that it's not a direct Roundabout or public theater program, but it's, it's always been incredibly important for me to make sure that the community knows that we're just kind of the middle management in this, mm -hmm. but you belong to the public and you belong to Roundabout, and that it's their program. Mm. Yeah, and that there's an invitation there, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that they feel part of it, that they yeah. feel part of that organization, that they are Roundabout you know, subscribers mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. Roundabout ticket buyers, along with the, the other people. And, and over the years, it's become, you know, I see people coming into an interpretive performance at Roundabout, and they see me giving out tickets or something, and they go, oh, it's a hands-on performance. And we're just part of the group. We're just part of the overall community. Mm -hmm. And so they're not segregated. They're not separate from it. They are part of that whole community. Mm -hmm. I love that you called out like mentioning that people are subscribers when they're there, because that's such an important mm -hmm. element to marketing is the experience when you're there. Really, it needs to be like from A to Z, from when you see your first ad or whatever the first touch point is with the show all the way through to your ticket buying, all the way through to your experience when you're there. Like that is what is going to build that affinity, yeah. not just like the programming itself. Um, there is some really interesting data from ABA about that about one third of audience members who buy tickets are there for the programming, like for the show itself, and about two thirds are there for something more, for the experience, for the community, for something else. That's 
the majority of people who are in our audiences are not just there, not just buying tickets because they want to see the show. They're looking for something more. And that has only been accelerated by the pandemic where people can have like so much programming at their fingertips on Netflix or whatever that they want that in-person community experience. And that's what's so crucial. And this is what I tell all my clients is it's so essential, not just to say like, hey, here's our show, but you need to say, this is what is going to happen when you are in the theater. Like, this is what it looks like. This is what your experience will be because you are selling all of that, not just the play. I wonder if that gets to, one of the things that I've heard really anecdotally from people is that they're trying to think about not just how do I engage the people who I have engaged with before, but this like, new audience, whatever that means, like who are they, I don't, you know, but but that for some people the barrier is that they just don't think of themselves as, as a theater person. And I would posit that it's like no one theater's job to try to fix that, but if you are trying to speak to those people, I, I wonder, you know, like our audiences maybe aren't back to the level that we would like them to be, but but concerts around the country are selling out. As you said, you know, like people are hungry for the live experience. And so I wonder if there's something in there that we can think about communicating about that aspect of what it is to go to theater. I mean, can we just, oh, sorry. No, no, go for it. You, you first. No. I'm still thinking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I almost, I, I want to touch on that lightly and then kind of circle yeah. back to uh, some of the points made here. So I, I think that there is like a light, and it's one of the exciting trends that I'm seeing uh, more on like the content creation side, um, especially in like pr producing organizations, of this uh, kind of like, you know, education on steroids, uh, you know, auxiliary and ancillary podcasts that are associated mm. with shows uh, that give you an opportunity to learn a little bit more about the institution, so that you can get aligned in a sense of its values. Uh, that that is something Playwrights Horizons does, and mm. Capacity Interactive. I know the public had a podcast. Um, I'm mentioning all podcasts because I love podcasts. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but additionally, and th th this is something that actually when we were at the public, yeah. our former colleague, uh, Rinaldi Linder Lolong, mm -hmm. uh, really helped to birth this. And this is kind of goes back to the values thing. So sorry for like going back to that right. question yeah. for no, a second. I don't um, but uh, one of the really exciting things that he introduced to us as a marketing team is this idea of commissioning graphic artists, commission, like coming, going into the community, going on Instagram, finding illustrators and designers um, that can essentially, you can pay to come attend the show and then they do fan art for the show, right? And the end result is you are reinvesting marketing dollars back into the pockets of artists, right? You are you know, getting this really cool, juicy content that you can share out on socials. The artists that are participating in the show like love it. I mean, that makes them feel like rock stars that people are like creating, uh, you know, content with their faces and their likeness on it. You know, I shouldn't say likeness because that that's the asterisk in the in the contract. Anyway, <laughs> scratch that. <laughs> but because um, <laughs> then it gets tricky. Um, but you, you know, I kind of going back to that last question. It's a little bit of a, you know, it's really important that your that your community, that your subscribers, that the individuals that are invested in your organization are aware of your values, but it is so a show not tell sometimes, especially for an institution like Ars Nova that I, it's gonna sound dorky, like I think we have like a cool, I'm like, as far as like reputations go, we're like one of the cooler edgier, so it would be like lame if we sent on an email that was like, hey everyone, we're, you know, a uh, fair pay initiative is happening or, you know, we, we have to be really kind of subtle in how we're communicating those ideas. Um, and in a way, it's like, instead of talking the talk, we're, we're really trying to walk it. We're trying to say, you know, we're investing, you know, marketing dollars back into the pockets of artists. We're not going to make a big thing of it. We're just going to do it. Um, you know, this name your price ticketing initiative that we're going to talk about a little bit later, we've taken a really interesting marketing approach, but it's, it's very, it's a more on the subtle side. And then the hope is that, like, you know, with support from our development teams and with kind of, we're giving our audiences the tools to, to spread the word themselves, right? So that we're not having to be the big, you know, flag waivers, ambassadors of our message, that we're doing the thing that a cool brand would do, yeah. which is like <laughs> being cool and hoping that your consumers talk about it. Um, sorry, that was such a tangent, but no, I. Hit on all the things. Yeah, yeah, we're hitting on things, yeah. yes. I also feel like a lot of theaters tend to put out those messages of like, hey, look what we do, when it's like Giving Tuesday or right. you know, end of your donation time or whatever, which as somebody who's run so many Giving Tuesday campaigns, <laughs> it doesn't work. Mm. Literally never. Yeah, you yeah. taught me that Giving Tuesday doesn't work. I, I, I remember like, this was the alley The public message. used to be my client. <laughs> <laughs> my friend was there. And I was like, do not 
please, it's such a waste of money. It's so <laughs> expensive, and you're not you're not going to beat out like other massive organizations that have massive budgets. But, Don't do it. But like most tactics in isolation, it's not no, no tactic in isolation is yeah. gonna work. You know, like that's the thing that I feel like whenever we talk about marketing or or fundraising to a certain extent. We do, we do sort of distill it down to talking about like the effectiveness of tactics. Ellie's absolutely right. Like that one thing alone is not, does not work. As a, as a piece of a strategy that is supported all year long, yes. or all month long, <clears throat> or that has a variety of different tactics attached to it, yeah. uh, including board giving, but that's a different story for Giving <laughs> Tuesday. Um, you know, like there's, there are opportunities, but I think a lot of institutions are under-resourced and or short-sighted and to the point that they just don't support things. Well, that's what I always say to my clients is, like, let's not do it for this one day where everybody's advertising and it's gonna be so much more expensive. Let's do it for the entire year. And I have one theater I work with that we actually run an institutional branding campaign for their entire season from like September through June. And it just is constantly running to all the audiences across the full funnel. Um, it's like a fairly minimal spend. It's like, you know, $30, $40 a day. So we're not talking massive amounts of money. And we just swap out content for it like as it comes up. Like if something gets, you know, if they get a cool article about them, if they have some like cool student matinee or initiative or whatever, like anytime something new and interesting pops up, we just throw it in that campaign. There's no call to action. There's no ask. We're not saying to people like, hey, donate, buy tickets, whatever. It's literally just like, here is this information about us. And they're my only theater where when it does come time for asks for you know, end of year or end of fiscal year donations, they always have a positive return on our campaigns. And they're the only one I could say that for. And I really think there is definitely a correlation between when we started doing that institutional branding mm -hmm. and you know, seeing that increase in donations. Because you don't have to tell people like, hey, these are all the cool things we're doing, really rushed at the end of December. Yeah. People are hearing about it all year, so they already have that in their heads. So then when it is time for the ask, they already are fond of you. I feel like I'm just yanking the conversation all over the place. But uh, fine, it's fine. Time. But, what, but what I, to go back to your point, I mean, about, about the, um, about the, sorry. I could sit and listen that, to you talk that all kind of day. <laughs> and you probably will, we got two hours. But anyway, uh, no, the, um, just to say, coming back to the institutional piece and the experience piece to tie that all in together and, and your question about what I interpret to be about Beyonce and Taylor Swift and all that um, is, it's you know, it's always about Beyonce. Like, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> let's, let's acknowledge that like coming to the theater in most cases is extremely uncomfortable. And the fact that a lot of venues are, ext I mean, I'm saying this as a 6'4", a very large person. It's, a, it's not the most accommodating experience, and I'm a fully able-bodied person. That's another whole other conversation. Um, but what gets people to fill, you know, you, you don't fill arenas with Brecht. You know, you fill arenas by things that, that give you, that give joy, mm -hmm. that, have, that people have a connection to. And I think that when, we're when we come back to, I would, I would take slight, not issue, but I would sort of say like spectacle is maybe not how I'd frame it, but I would frame it around joy, around the things that people are like flocking to right now to get the, to get out of this kind of collective, whatever we want to call it right now. Like yeah. I do feel like the country is in a collective stupor at the moment around a variety of different things, and to and there's getting folks euphoria, to think, there's effervescence, there's something yeah. like about that moment. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I feel like right. that if we're going for the for the challenges we have around com the theater going experience. I think that's the biggest barrier we have to getting people to experience new work, to take risks on work, is the physical space and the social expectation around what we do. The people that, you know, we hear in survey after survey for decades now, I feel, about the fact that people don't feel like the theater's for them because there are unspoken rules about what you have to do to go to see a piece of theater. Um, and, mo and no one theater is gonna change that perception. So, you know, we talk about this all the time in our firm. My, one of my VPs, Cynthia, um, who's been in the theater field for 45 years, you know, or 40 years, talks all the time about like, where's the got milk campaign for the, for the arts right now? Because that's what we need for something that is completely institution agnostic, completely regionally agnostic, completely genre agnostic, to talk about the fact that, you know, coming to see an arts event has life affirming, life enriching communal experiences and, avail and things that, that make, a, you know, a part of humanity available to you. And None of us can afford to do that alone. I'd yeah. probably offer, so thank you for that, because yes. I think what you're pointing to. Please shut to, me up. <laughs> <laughs> never. Uh, what I think you're pointing to, I approach from my work in audience development, particularly with communities of color, in a very specific way. Mm -hmm. I think it aligns with when we're talking about the deaf and hard of hearing community or accessibility in terms of other ways. Um, that invitation and welcome is so important, you know, particularly as a marketer who also creatively produces work. I think what I've experienced in, in my time, in my career, is that just changing who's on stage is not enough in order to make people feel like an experience sparks joy or is for them, right? 
we know that represent, representational politics like does not work. We know that because you know, we had a black president for eight years and look how that turned out, right? Like, we know that like, just putting someone into a position of power, in a position of visibility alone, does not shift a system or structure to make it more welcoming. And so the work that I am most excited by now changes the actual ritual of attendance. Like if you attend a black queer gathering like Prey, it is unlike many different gatherings, right? You know, we have to take off our shoes when we enter to the, the door. We have to uh, call and respond. There's, there's, a, um, there's a joy and there's a religion at, pray, at, at play there, right? Um, the same can be true for queer gatherings. The same can be true for Latine gatherings. The same can be true uh, for any community that is really um, at the center of a conversation, right? And so a lot of my work involves us recentering, like who is in that conversation, um, which is why the company is called Center Arts, because we think about centering people, right? But I think that that ultimately changes how and why we gather in a really exciting way. And once we do that authentically, people will come. So authentically, folks knew that Beyonce was for them and you couldn't find like silver sparkly cowboy hats anywhere this summer, right? Because we knew that that was the ritual. We knew that that was the invitation. Same with Taylor Swift, you know, same with all these big moments of effervescence and joy and spectacle. If they are authentically about us, then people will come. And that invitation I think transcends um, you know, whether it's a sales campaign or whether it's just, you know, marketing or institutional, and it, it becomes more about, am I actually welcome here? Um, yeah, so I think that, that touches on a lot of what has been shared so far, but particularly through a lens of authenticity. And can I add to that, Brian? Because I, th I think in addition to that, like, authenticity, that it, there, that an invitation, like an authentic invitation mm -hmm. from marketing and press teams is important, not just for the show, if you're a producing organization, not for just for the show that you think that, that yeah, exactly, which, which I think that is an exciting trend that I've been, that I've noticed us moving away from in the last, you know, few years, certainly. I mean, I, a, a consistent invitation to community, to communities, to whether it be, you know, deaf and hard of hearing communities, to culturally specific communities, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm seeing it happen with the kind of producing orgs, the marketing directors I know, partnering with consultants. And I think just to say, Brian, we like talked about this over drinks a few days ago, like there is a lot of work that needs to be done for that work to kind of happen internally inside of an organization from, you know, the mm. way that these organizations are structured, but also in the way that marketing teams are, are communicating to patrons. Um, and, you know, it's, it, there's, there just needs to be a lot of, intentionality. There needs to be intention in who you're communicating with uh, and there needs to be consistency. But I'm, I'm optimistic because I'm, I'm noticing, um, and especially in the work that you're doing, Brian, like that, that is, that is, I'm seeing that on the rise. I'm seeing that happen, you know. I just had a quick thought, which is, yeah. and I totally agree with what you guys are saying. You know, we work with a lot of, cult, what I'm going to put in quotes, culturally specific organizations, Valley Hispanico, East West Players, a bunch of different you know, organizations. I always want to challenge every organization to accept the fact that every organization is culturally specific. <laughs> they might not want to acknowledge the culture that they've engendered or the culture that they sit within, mm -hmm. but almost every institution is culturally specific. So how do we think about the culture that is perceived as exclusionary or unwelcoming? Because that, that is your culture, whether you want to believe, whether, you, mm -hmm. whether that is intentional or not is a different, is a different question. Mm -hmm. But we all have, have cultivated some kind of culture within institutions, whether mm -hmm. it's by genre, whether it's by venue, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I um, just, I feel like that's a helpful provocation whenever we're having any of these conversations about where we sit intersectionally as organizations to say if we were, you know, what is the culture that we are, we are sitting in, that we, that we represent? Mm -hmm. um, so anyway. I, I think that really goes back to what Brian was saying earlier about, you know, changing, a change of leadership doesn't change culture. Yeah. A change in representation doesn't change culture. Like, they, they may be a piece of that, yeah. but that alone isn't going to be the thing that makes a whole new culture spring up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we've done so much of this already, so just like a lightning round, because I think I said um, that this, I would, I would bring together a panel of people who could talk about what's working and what's not. So, lightning round, what's working? Like something that you, some tactic, some approach, something you've seen that you're like, yeah, that worked for me or for them or whatever. And then we'll do one about what's not. <laughs> you Partnerships. First. <laughs> say it again? Partnerships. Partnerships. And then say it louder. <laughs> Partnerships. No, but can, I just want to, I'll be very brief. I know you're, you know, that's a lie by now, but I'm going to try. <laughs> um, you know, like so much of what right now is about like 
expense containment, let's be clear, when we talk about audiences being slow to come back. Partnerships are a great way to, both from a marketing standpoint, from a producing standpoint, from an awareness standpoint, um, to, to remedy that. So many organizations, whether they're trying to reach new people, cut down their costs, all that, that's just the name of the game everywhere. So it's all safe for now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We touched on this already, but um, from what I'm seeing, again, selling the experience is what's really working. Mm -hmm. If you do not have a video, and I specifically say video, not just still images, that is about your experience at your theater, like go back on Monday, what day is today? I don't know. Whatever you're next to the office. <laughs> I, just I think more. today's Wednesday. Today's Wednesday. Cool. So tomorrow, Thursday. Um, and make that video. Make that happen. Because I think that is just so crucial. The number of times that I've seen a video like that get pushed out and it just performs so well. It's, mm -hmm. it's just, it's such a great asset to have. So I would say selling the experience for sure is really, really working well. I, I mean, the only thing that I can that I can think of, I mean, it's just this term community that mm -hmm. I think is just so important. I mean, the, the the community that we work with is a community, and you know, it's when when we do a show when it's interpreted. I mean, the reason why we do interpreted performances and not kind of just put an interpreter someplace for a person is just that thing of seeing a hundred people or fifty, you know, however many people talking to each other. You can't get that people out of the theater after. It's mm -hmm. that it's that existence of that community being within that community. I, you know, I mean, I, I felt it when, we, when, it, when the pandemic started kind of waning a little bit, and I went to see Music Man. And just the idea of being in a shared space with, you know, I was with a friend, but I mean, being in that audience with other people was exhilarating. It was fun, but it was that shared experience with all these people. And when we do a show or when everybody, you know, when, when you're with people that are like you, that's the that's kind of the experience. You know, you could be in a you're you're with other people and you're with unlike you people as well in in that kind of shared space. But I think the gathering of people, the comfort level and that experience of being being with people that you know that you haven't seen for a while, it's it's that's what that's what I see and that's what I love. I love when I when I'm giving out the tickets and somebody comes up to me and hugs me and says, "Oh, how are you doing?" That I know the audience and they know me and they ask about me and I think that that is the part that is is what I cherish about what I do. Our three responses are so connected yeah. <laughs> so far. Yeah. Like they're real all they're all kind of circling the mm -hmm. same thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, you're speaking my language. I just <laughs> love anything about gathering community. Yeah. Um, I think the thing that's most exciting to me that's working well is in particularly theater organizations, theater companies, can be more than just a theater company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When their relevance is far beyond the work that's happening on stage and ripples <coughs> into the community. Um, I'll shout out a former client of mine, Baltimore Center Stage in Baltimore, Maryland, who created this really fantastic program of uh, sharing space. So it's called the Shared Space Initiative, where they're giving as much of their space away for free as possible. Um, Akia, right? Yeah. Yesterday you shared something that was happening at the 14th Street Y, and I was like, that's amazing. And you're all doing, the, like, in many ways, very similar things, trying to activate uh, these spaces of, by, and for the community, but making sh sure that folks have ownership, right? And doing what you can to either, like, radically subsidize or swing the door doors as wide open as possible. I think that's what creates the case for um, belonging and for relevance, is when folks feel like, it's not just you know a walled building that they don't have access to or can only come in if they buy a ticket, but it's actually their community space. So, I, like National Black Theater, we're partnering with right now on Prey, and I, I see them doing that so well, Shadé mm -hmm. and Jonathan. I mean, they, and they literally just to say are do not have the building right now. Like they are going to have a theatrical space. So it is the ultimate practice of like how do you create something that is more than just a theater, create like a brand and identity that people want to commune around. So. Just adding that to that. And to my lightning round answer, a content forward, a content forward approach that uh, allows you to go kind of that mile deep. I'll, I'll kind of use that as my thing. I think that when we are all in theatrical spaces, whether we want to be or not, we are kind of dramaturgs. We are, we are you know, uh, we have a positionality and we're, we're, you know, having the show kind of run through us and we're processing in our own way. Uh, and having that kind of auxiliary, ancillary content that you can either engage with before or after, I think can make a really big difference in how you retell the story of that show. Um, and if you can arm your audiences with that, um, it makes, again, to my point before, 
it makes them do the work for you as a marketer. <laughs> They're the ones spreading the good word uh, and evangelizing. And um, I'm, I'm loving that I'm seeing more of that mm -hmm. in the industry. I like your response better than mine. <laughs> I'm, I want to like highlight False. in bold. <laughs> content is just content is like the most important thing because also goes across everything that you know applies to email to social like everything. Mm -hmm. It is could not make it more crucial. Your previous point about like I was I learned it as the white glove technique where you take the good news and you put on your white glove like a server and you shove it down everyone's throat. <laughs> <laughs> like that is actually like a tie a time tested. Uh, practice that I couldn't agree with more. So, mm. yeah, they're really great ideas here. I feel like those yeah. are take, take that and run with it. You know. <laughs> and what in the lightning round of what is not working, or maybe put a gentler way, what could we release? What are the things that we're like? We're, we're still like you were releasing Giving Tuesday, which I <laughs> right Fine. release it. You revoke release yeah. it. No pressure. What else are you releasing? No. <laughs> I mean, I have like a list. Of <laughs> I, I made myself mentally like pare down my list to my number one thing um, okay. because I could have like a list of seven things. Um, the top one for me is uh, there's a big fixation on subs and donors and loyal audiences, which is understandable. These are people who are giving us a lot of money, so it's necessary. But it's often coming at the expense of audience retention. And that is um, an upsetting trend to me because it's way more expensive. It's six to seven times more expensive, actually, according to Bain, um, to get a new audience member mm -hmm. than yeah. to retain a pre-existing audience member. And there is definitely this big trend I'm seeing where people are sort of like really focused on subs, donors, loyal audiences, really focused on new to file. And then the people in the middle who have like come, you know, see a show or two, they're sort of left behind. And we just, we literally cannot afford to do that. Um, we're hemorrhaging money by not paying a lot of attention to those audiences. One of the most interesting things that came out of the ABA study that we found was that um, marketing directors ranked their, their audience priorities. And audience retention, actually, for the majority of respondents, came in in the bottom half of priorities, which was wild to me, because mm -hmm. I feel like that's just so crucial. Um, so maybe you're sitting there thinking, like, I do a lot of audience retention. And if so, like, I, great, and I love that for you, and I'm glad. But there is definitely a big trend of people not doing that. Um, and I have lots of ways I could talk for like an hour about how to do that, but I'm not going to. In the vein of Tom, I'm going to mm. shut myself up. But audience retention. Okay. Mm. Oh, the thing I'm leaving behind, I love this question. I want to leave behind um, false binaries. Mm. Either or thinking is like a tool of supremacy and it will always get you. So like when everyone, if anyone in your universe says it is either subscribers or single ticket yeah. donors, it is mm. either core audiences or investing in new audiences. Those are, uh, you know, setups. That's, that's an equation that doesn't actually work. Mm -hmm. And I think that the most successful organizations <clears throat> that I've worked with have found a way to incorporate both, right? Mm -hmm. um, to recognize that it's all the work and that either your campaigns or your strategy or the way that you message mm -hmm. is one that is as inclusive to the people who have been committed to supporting your organization mm -hmm. Um, and you trust them enough to go along on this journey as it is welcoming to new audiences, right? And so even the numbers reflect that, sure, we might not have the same sort of subscriber retention as we once did. Um, and we are doing well, if not better, with new audiences, even though it's more expensive and our dollar doesn't go as far. But there's still a case to be made for campaigns that equally look at both or think about looking at both in a relationship that makes sense. Um, I'll strike the word equally because I don't think that for every show or for every organization it'll be 50-50 in terms of that mix. Um, but anyone who says one or the other is lying to you. Yeah. I deeply concur. <laughs> um, how do I put this short briefly? Um, <laughs> you know, I, I thought a lot about this question, and mine is more of a practice than, a, than, a, than an approach or a tactic. But um, I think the role, uh, this is a panel on marketing and audience development, and we're talking about some pretty lofty topics because that's where this topic belongs. Um, and I think we need to take marketers out of the space of just being at the end of the conveyor belt or the end of the assembly line to say like, okay, we've made this thing, now why is the house not full? Um, marketers need to be, mar we've talked for so long about the silos between marketing and development, and it's time to talk about the silos between marketing and the audience and artistic programming. Um, and so I'm, so I'm very glad you're here. Uh, but, uh, but, but I mean, there's a, uh, there's, I just feel like the organizations that are successful right now are finding ways to develop a shared language between those two that does not feel like a sacrifice of mission. Because it is not a sacrifice of mission to give a shit what your audience thinks. It is not a sacrifice of mission to do things that people want to see. 
if it's in line with your you know stated aims as an organization. Um, and I feel like for too long, you know, the, I always used to describe to my students that the difference between marketing and the you know corporate world and the consumer products world and the arts is that in the arts you get no say in, in what you're marketing. Um, and that is still mostly true in most institutions, but I think a lot of organizations right now, and we see this a lot in the presenting world and more so, in, in, increasingly so in the producing world, um, they're finding ways to have those conversations, not to say we're going to totally take a populist approach and abandon any of our, you know, um, any of our you know, previous claims to our mission and our values and what we exist to produce, but to maybe just find the right balance of what's, gonna, what's going to be enough of a gateway to welcome people into this institution so they'll see the other things, and how, does, how can the marketing team be you know, useful in having that conversation. Mm -hmm. I do think we need to accept the fact that to ignore the insights that the marketing team has or marketing specialists or whatnot have about the audience and say, no, no, artistic knows best is just a form of elitism and it's a form of putting uh, an artistic programming team um, in, a, in a place that is completely out of line with what we talk about when we're talking about community and values and um, just honoring the public good that we claim to stand for as arts nonprofits. Um, I say we because I still feel like I'm in one even though I now have a consult consultancy. I work with so many of them. Um, but anyway, that's the practice I hope we can leave behind and start to have a fuller conversation in, in institutions. Mm. Tell me. Um, it's not so much leave, leave behind as, as that I wish, um, because I think we're, like everybody's kind of uh, working with the same community in terms of who the audience is, I wish there was more kind of collegiality mm -hmm. or you know, um, collaboration on the top level about providing the services that they want to provide, because ultimately there's a small, there's a small uh, you know, resource pool is a small community that we're dealing with, but everybody is kind of doing their work independently and not looking, not that, not kind of focusing on the idea that it's the same group of people that we're trying to, you know. So, so I wish that there was more collaboration at that level. I wish there was more kind of inclusion of the people that actually work in the community that mm -hmm. know the community a little bit better, so that it wasn't so segregated and so um, isolated in terms of what people are doing so that we could help and be more collaborative and not just go, if somebody else is doing something, maybe don't do it on that day because something else is going on. So if people were just a little bit more aware of other things that were going around, mm -hmm. going on with those communities that they want in, mm -hmm. that would be great. Mm -hmm. great. Would you like to release something? Yeah, I, I think my, I hope my answer doesn't get me in trouble. I, I, I was like act actively thinking about changing it as we were going down the line and I was like, no, I'm gonna say it. Um, uh, and I, th I think it has to do with mar uh, uh, a marketing campaign's relationship with press specifically. And I, and I know this is, the, this is the song that has been sung year after year, as long as I've been in this industry, but it specifically as it relates to critics. I, th I, th I think that, uh, especially in the way a lot of producing houses are modeled in New York City. Um, the majority, a lot of the performances are happening in previews, and then when a performance finally gets to a press opening, it's, there's a lot of kind of missed revenue, and, you know, and folks are usually waiting for uh, some, someone whose voice is a value to tell them if it's a good piece or not. I, I, I see a really beautiful trend happening in kind of these empowering micro-influencers and uh, you know, uh, theater companies offering again with their invitation to communities like their candid like consistent invitation to communities like these tastemakers coming in and and uplifting and supporting shows like authentically um i i see that happening i i wish if i had a magic wand that i could just like release some of the power that a that a that a review can have on a piece um this coming from a show like we had an amazing review like yeah it's wonderful it's wonderful when it's great right <laughs> we'll take them i know yeah, we'll yeah. take them right well, i will love them thank you thank yeah. you so much but um i i i i wonder what the next you know decade looks like in an industry where you know we are uh where organizations are really uh doubling down on their values and um that maybe consumers are more interested in taking a chance to go see a show at an organization whether or not they've heard it's the greatest thing of all time or you know whether or not there's like some kind of a-list star in it um I, I know that that is such an idealistic thought, but I, th I think that you know education and uh, like a content forward approach can make a really big difference in re kind of framing the way that audiences 
uh, participate in your piece on like a you know transactional level. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, Fern, are you seeing now, like post pandemic, that a review is having the same power that it once did? I n no, I, I I wanted I I wanted to have the best. I mean, it, again, yeah, yeah, you, it's so releasing it, that cool. with the highs the highs are highs and the lows aren't as low as they yeah. used to be. That is my observation in like the institutions I've worked at and in talking to other marketing directors. Um, but I, I like I, I think you know not to like pat myself on the back, but I think it's because of what I was just saying. I think that a lot of marketers are are doubling down on content and they're like whether or not. You know, so and so person says that this is a fantastic show. We're yeah. going to be serving up a lot of really interesting ancillary content that is going to prove to you why this is something you cannot miss. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, yeah. Sorry, I, no, no, sorry no. to cut you off. I was just going to say, I feel like so. I'm glad you're bringing this up because I feel like so often when we're talking about evolution of you know marketing and and communications and whatnot for the arts, we just completely ignore the greater macro factors of the media landscape right now. I mean, if you look at what's happening in traditional legacy media and digital media and all sorts of media, um, those, those business models are shifting, their influence is shifting, look at how much they're being inserted into political you know, division in the country. There's so many things that, that erode trust in media, and yet we still think of it as this, this element of our you know, earned media strategies that are, that are going to sort of make or break a show, uh, or a, a property, or whatever it is. Um, and, and I feel like, you know, that's also the piece that I feel like is missing from the conversation, large, big picture when we're talking about the trends in the field, is that you know there, were, there was a huge correction happening in the sort of digital and tech and media space at the same time that we were experiencing a huge downturn in audiences post-pandemic, and there was never a correlation made in any of the industry media around that. Yeah. And I just want to, I want to, I guess my point is, A, I want better arts journalism, and B, I want less navel-gazing. I want us to actually talk about how we exist as a, a microcosm in a larger system and start really thinking about how that all play, is interdependent and weaves together to create the outcomes that we're seeing. Um, yeah. End of rant. Right. Talk about TikTok. I don't want to like, scare people, but we're going to talk about TikTok for a second. <laughs> um, I'm ready. Because it's actually so important. Yes. Younger generations, like 18 to 24 year olds, yeah. place a lot more value on what random people, aka not mainstream media, not news sources, are saying on TikTok and you know, Instagram to a lesser extent than what they're seeing on mainstream media. Right. And that's a trend that is very much on the rise and is not going to change. So very much so, like to your point, that that younger audiences, if that's who we're looking for, they don't care at all what the New York Times has to say. They care about like what the random person who lives down the street from them in the city has to say. Yeah. And that's where they're finding information and their news is from places like TikTok. Mm -hmm. And I, I just think, you know, Fern, to your point, I'm not sure if we can have it both ways. Yeah. Like if we, either disbelieve the systems of sort of like media and whether or not they're advantageous for us, but then are the first to sort of brag about a review when it happens. I think that's a little bit disingenuous from our organizations who, you know, complain when times are bad and then rave when times are good. It's either you want it or you don't, right? And I think that if we say that that kind of coverage is nice to have, but we're building strategies, whether it's content or sort of mm -hmm. own property strategies that um, speak directly to our communities that don't wait for a third party to authenticate the value of our work, that platform our artists, that connect with the micro-influencers, all that's the bedrock. And then, you know, what the New York Times says, you can take it or leave it. Mm -hmm. But I do think that, like, we're, we're seeing that shift happening, or at least I'm seeing it with my clients, but I think it requires a greater sort of investment in some of those considerations I heard a lot about in 2020. I heard a lot about media bias. I heard a lot about lack of access, particularly for um, non-traditional shows. And I just would like to see us follow that through. Underline, underline, yes. Yeah. I totally agree. So earlier, Tom mentioned the connection between marketing and programming. And I want to dig into that a little bit more with you, Brian. One of the things I want to frame around this conversation, though, is that at Art New York, we serve a lot of organizations where those people are not siloed because they're the same person. Yeah, correct. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's very, I, I've worked in that organization, and many, many people that I work with at Art New York I, I experience that on a regular basis. So. So there isn't a silo, but there might be a sort of like ingrained uh, approach to thinking about them at different times and in different ways. So I, I think that regardless of the size of the organization, it is possible that we are siloing the type of work, whether or not they're siloed people. You have a, a background as a creative producer in addition to your marketing expertise. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the connection between the two. How do you, how do you think about those things as connected in your work? 
Yeah, and I think uh, Tom spoke about this a little bit earlier, which is the reason why I got out of marketing in the first place. <laughs> Same. Which was, it, <laughs> it's tough, man. You know, you, I feel like particularly um, when I was a regional marketing director for a Lort Theater Company, I remember um, being asked to back into a narrative of either relevancy or social justice for a show that was programmed, you know, a year and a half earlier that was not relevant to the community that we were approaching. And then I was held accountable for those metrics, right? Mm -hmm. And I felt um, a real disconnect, uh, particularly because this was around 2016. I was living in Washington, DC. Um, and I felt like the work that I was doing was not only addressing this really critical moment in our political landscape, but also uh, that was very disconnected from real change, right? And so I personally recognized that if I wanted to make a difference in my work, I needed to have my hands on the wheel. And I think that aligned with an opportunity to join the public uh, on the artistic staff to really dive more into what creative producing can be. Now, since leaving, I am a you know, creative producer in my own right. I support projects uh, you know, off-Broadway, commercially, as well as uh, internationally. And I find that I'm most excited when I work with artist makers who also sit, sit in that space, right? Mm -hmm. Most of the artists that I'm really compelled to work with have been responsible for galvanizing their community and their audiences for years. They find space by themselves. They market by themselves. They get on Canva and create their own you know, assets, right? We can't think of the artists in 2023 as just sitting on that side of the fence, right? Mm -hmm. What happens if there is no fence? What happens if we're all doing the work together, right? So I think in much the same way as the marketers might be sidelined, sometimes an institution, mm -hmm. the generative artists are also not at the table. And I think that we all have to come together to make sure that there's a robust conversation around um, all the assets we have and how we can leverage those equally. Yeah. So sometimes that might mean that your um, generative artist who has a following, you know, in Brooklyn, they know how to reach those people. They know that an email coming from them will matter 10 times more than an email coming from you. Mm -hmm. um, they know what kind of content works best. And they know that because they've been forced to do that for years. Right. And so the more that we can sort of uh, amplify the work that's already happening on the ground that is super useful. I think that that helps. Um, as a creative producer, I also love to see artists who are, um, you know, my focus is on black, brown, queer, trans, BIPOC folks. Uh, and the work that we do, as I mentioned earlier, fundamentally changes how and why we gather. And I'm interested in those shows and in those experiences that are, um, authentic and relevant enough that we are actually doing something different, right? So I very rarely present in a proscenium. I can't tell you the last time I did a proscenium show. Um, that's tough, right? Because if I wanted to do a show on Broadway, my options go from 42 theaters to two theaters, right? <laughs> yeah. So all of a sudden I'm already thinking about commercial producing in a way that is not running through that particular like, you know, vein of, of a platform. And I'm thinking more about how we activate folks where they are, where the conversations are already happening, where the communities are already gathering, you know? Um, programming queer black art in a church, programming Latine gatherings at a, you know, street festival. Like there, there are ways that we can actually think about the creative producing um, in a way that also sort of frontlines the marketing. And then maybe the last thing I'll add for the uh, organizations that feel like that might be a little bit radical, I've seen really wonderful um, arts leaders who exist in this liminal space of the art and the business. I'll shout out Stephanie Ibarra, who is a former uh, artistic director at Baltimore Center Stage, uh, who many of us know. Um, really, really brilliant leader. Who was who, on a panel for us yesterday, just connecting the oh. dots. For the oh, yeah, yeah. So the, the and also is now yeah. at the Mellon Foundation <laughs> yeah. and is uh, super amazing. Um, there are ways in which, as a creative producer, uh, I witnessed Stephanie and other leaders uh, making really, really smart shifts in the way that they program uh, a season in order to accommodate for fluxes in, say, um, revenue or audiences or cash flow. Things like, we assume that our first show in the fall has to be our big community number with 30 people. Does that have to be the case, right? Can you program the really amazing two-hander in the fall that normally uh, common wisdom would say has to go in March? Uh, do we save, you know, the largest set pieces for the spring where we know that our influx of subscription cash in March will actually offset the expenses? So we're not sort of like leading with sunken cost in the season, but moving forward, right? Is there a way for us particularly now to encourage our boards to think about um, 
fiscal planning in, in three year cycles, not just one, right? Whether or not this one season is sort of like above or below the line is less important than whether we're making a case for the next three years and how we sort of like arc, right? Um, that's happening in a lot of places that I find is super exciting. The more that we can sort of shift our language and our assumptions around artistic producing uh, in a way that can also address some of these shifts, I think it also helps us as marketers think about how we best meet our community. So there are a lot of sort of like bright spots that I'm seeing in the world, both as a creative producer and as a marketer, but those experimentations I think are super key. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's all, it, this panel is a dream because you're all just like connecting yeah. with each other in such <laughs> great ways. But you know, it's kind of connected to what Fernando said earlier about like a, a, an inch wide, a mile deep, right? You're like, if you're programming with a community in mind and thinking about how you deeply and authentically engage with that community, then you're already doing the work of the marketing. You've done it. Yeah. You know, that, that's the whole thing. In, that, in, is, <laughs> that is the market. Yeah, yeah. That is the, the market, market yeah. right? But yeah. I also think that like, you know, our communities are wise, we know. Um, you are given the example of, the, of uh, working at the public earlier and I want to shout out Rich Denny, who in many ways was like, and, and you know Rich, like was just like the sort of internal uh, standard bearer of accessibility, right? Mm -hmm. And in many ways, our organizations need those people, right? Because it can't, we can't hand off those relationships uh, with community to the organization if we also don't have the folks who are actually advocating within the organizations and taking that on. And that could be your accessibility advocate, that could be people of color in positions of power who can actually reach out to communities with authenticity. But we need to sort of incorporate that into our fibers so that we can do the best work. Beth, I want to ask you the next question because it's related to programming. You have a really unique sort of vision on what it is to, to, to what, the, what the type of programming and content might bring to your audience because you are selling tickets to a group of people, but you're selling tickets from a variety of different organizations. You're not picking the work, but you are funneling through. And so from your perspective, I think, I think this is a two-part question. I think one, it, it's like, is there anything you think theater leaders should consider if they're thinking about programming work that might attract a deaf or hard of hearing audience? And then anything else that, that how that relates to ASL interpretive performances and, and actually getting people to buy those tickets? Because I think you and I have talked about the fact that it isn't just uh, do it and everyone shows up. Right? It, right. People still have to want to come to see the show. Like, what do you want people to know about that? Well, and... And, and listening to everybody on the panel too, it's you know we're in we're in a strange situation where I don't have necessarily the ability to program. You know I'm kind of at the will the will of the theaters that are asking us mm -hmm. to help them with their programming. So you know it's something that that we're grappling with right now because it's like how do we either include the community because I'm listening to everybody and I'm going like deaf people or blind people any any person with a disability who's dependent on a service is is basically getting the service based on somebody else making the decision for them mm -hmm. and not them and they don't have the luxury of saying I, I can open up the you know the paper and pick that show and go see that show so so we're kind of making these decisions which at this time is becoming incredibly uncomfortable you know, from my perspective, just going, you know, it's a whole power thing. It's like I, I try to, I try to kind of look at um, when a theater kind of asks us to do something, to not look at it as my personal aesthetic, mm -hmm. but what I think the community is going to like. But then you realize all the things that are being excluded mm. from what the potential the, the community would like, because we're also dealing with limited resources in terms of the service providers in terms of interpreters, in terms of deaf advisors, um, as well as, as you know, a finite number of audience members to come and see it. So we're trying to figure out, like, how do we include the community? Like, how do we get people to, you know, and it's not a homogeneous community. It's not like I go, oh, deaf community, tell me what you <laughs> want, and that kind of answers the question. Mm -hmm. It's not. It, it's made up of a lot of individuals who have a lot of individual um, you know per perceptions about what they want so it's so you, you try to kind of look at things and give people a variety of choices but understanding I mean just listen to everybody it's like you, you have to it's you're picking and choosing I'm making the decision 
I'm saying this is, this is what we're offering, and this is what you can go and see. You can't go see that because it's not, we're not picking that one, we're picking this one. So it's, it's, it's becoming a very, not so much uncomfortable, but, but we're trying to figure out how do we make it more inclusive of the community. I mean, do we say, OK, here's the, you know, the 500 shows that are going on in New York. Pick what you want. I mean, it, it just, I don't think it works that way. It's, you know, there's money involved. There's budgets involved. I mean, there's other, and like I said, there's limited resources in terms of interpreters. Not everything can be interpreted. It's just impossible. So it has to be a pick and choose. And so that the responsibility is, is, is becoming something that's not as comfortable as it used to be, I guess, when there were less offerings. Mm. Um, and so I don't, has, I don't have an answer to it. I just right. know that it's, it's something that we have to involve the community more mm. about how they want. You know, we're, we're getting into a point, too, in terms of representation, where there's representation that are on stage that we don't necessarily have equal representation in terms of service providers that we're providing. Mm. Do you want to see that show? Do you not, you know, do you want to see a show with, you know, five Chinese actors up there? If I can't find five, if I can't find, you know, Chinese or Asian and American interpreters, is, are white interpreters okay? And, you know, I mean, and, and I don't have the answer to that, and I don't know from the community what they want, you know, in terms of who we are as interpreters or service providers versus what you want to see on stage. So it's, I don't know if any of that answered your question, but it's just becoming, it, it's, it's, it's a question that we're asking and yeah. pondering and trying to figure out. I mean, I think what it, what it brings up for me is really the, the, what you're saying, which is like, you were asking questions, and I know you, you and I have talked about mm -hmm. how you have plans to actually ask right. your community those right. questions. Yeah. But, but I think that's an interesting lesson that we can all think about, right? Is like, we have to ask the questions, and we have to go to our communities that mm -hmm. we're trying to serve and ask them those questions mm -hmm. to understand if the thing that we're programming is actually going to meet the need, fulfill the public good, all of those things. Are we actually going to do that, or are we just sort of like putting it out there and saying, they'll come? Yeah, and that's not sacrilege either to mm -hmm. say yeah. that we're interested in the conversations yeah. that are already happening on the ground. And we're interested in using our platform as marketers and producers mm -hmm. to amplify those conversations. Mm -hmm. I think you said the same thing earlier, which yeah. is like, how can we actually break that silo down? Yeah. And be conscious of who we're not asking. Because I think that when we're talking about you know, the folks, I, I gave that very long answer earlier about you know, talking to our audiences and using our databases and all those kinds of things. Um, but, but if we're asking the same people we've always had and we're not forming the partnerships that are going to expose us to other people, you know, we're, we're not necessarily doing all of this with an attitude of or an, 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 an um, intention around expansion. Mm, yeah. it's, it's, about, it's about sort of continuing to talk to the same people over and over again. One of the phrases that, that came up for me when I was thinking of, and prepping for this panel that we've actually touched on without having to say it is meeting audiences where they are. Mm -hmm. And we've, everybody has given some response that speaks to that. But I think the sort of core beginning of that is just knowing where they are. You can't meet them there if you don't know where that is where the there is. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the ways that folks are talking about accomplishing that is through new and flexible ticketing models. Like, we're going to get to the nuts and bolts of it for a second. Let's talk about that a little bit. So um, Tom, we chatted online a little bit about, about this, but I read a blog post on your website. It was written by, is it Rainy or Ra Ronnie. Ronnie. Ronnie? Ronnie. Ronnie Haywood wrote this blog post about flexible ticketing models. And I wondered if you could share the highlights of that piece and tell us how you're working with organizations to respond to shifts in audience behavior. Sure. Um, just for context, Ronnie Haywood is one of our VPs. She's based in Sydney, Australia, where I will be in two days. So Woo! I'm ready for some jet lag. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, so but that piece, the whole premise of that piece was really around some things we've been hitting on as we've talked on the panel today, around um, certainly pushing back against either or thinking and thinking the, or you know thinking that you have to sort of choose between a false binary, a false choice. Um, but it basically is all about the historical conversation we've had around marketing has been around, you know, is it a subscription theater, is it a membership theater, or is it just a single ticket kind of a model? Uh, and, and what that whole piece was really about was, was providing a framework, and I, I don't have it as a visual here, but providing a framework to think about all the different ways that, you, that, uh, that your decision to basically package up your offerings 
it says a lot about the structure of your season, but it also says a lot about how accessible you are to the different buying preferences of your audiences, and that you don't have to choose one. You don't even have to choose two. You just have to be able to very clearly communicate what your different options are. So in that case, it was you know framing it around something we do with organizations all the time, um, particularly, as I mentioned, since we work beyond the theater, we work with other art forms, um, we'll have folks who are saying, well, we, are, we, offer a, uh, we want to move to a, a membership model, but we have a really traditional fixed subscriber we don't want to alienate. And the point we always make is, you're not alienating that person. That's what that person wants. So let them continue having what they want and find ways to talk to these people who don't want that and offer them this new model. Maybe they want to choose their shows later. Maybe they want to choose a different, at a, you know, they want to give themselves some freedom over the course of the season. There are different ways to give shape to that person's loyalty beyond just one offering that your theater or your organization has to choose from. Wow. And so right now, it's no secret to anybody that subscriptions over the past 15, 20 years have been on a pretty steady decline uh, and that the pandemic accelerated that. Um, there are theaters, however, that I will, I'm here to tell you that I do have clients where their subscriber base is growing. So I hate to be the skunk at the garden party, but it is true. Um, uh, but um, that's because that theater offers something that, uh, that is predictable, frankly, to that audience and, and, and falls within a certain uh, set of parameters that they, they feel comfortable subscribing to every year. There are, however, going to be people within that audience who, for whatever reason, are never going to know their calendar. They're never going to know their schedule. But they still want to show loyalty to that theater. Are we going to say no to them because they don't want to buy everything? And so the, just the thesis of that piece was really just that we do not have to push ourselves into the false choice of saying if we choose this one thing, we want to do a Lincoln, Lincoln Center style membership, not a roundabout style subscription. You can do all of those things within your institution if you're clear about how you communicate those offerings mm -hmm. and if you're clear about the value proposition of each of them. And, and be clear about the fact that you just don't have to, you don't have to choose one or the other and that you have, the, you have that range of options all within one institution. Um, and that's not just for a huge you know, giant bureaucratic arts institutions. That's for small, uh, small theaters and small institutions as well. Uh, that was what that piece was referring to. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Fernando, we're going to talk about another ticketing model that you are all trying at Ars Nova, which is a uh, name. It, I'm going to say it right. Name your price initiative. Name your price. What's ours is yours. I oh. I know. <laughs> Very you have a career. Fun. I know. Like, forward. Fun. <laughs> Um, can you tell us more about how that, that model operates and how's it going for you? Yeah, and that, I, I just want to say you transitioned beautifully into this because it was all intentional. Yeah. I know, it's all, we're all just <laughs> yeah. flowing into things. Yeah. So, White glove. <laughs> um, so, the Name Your Price Ticketing Initiative, um, What's Ours Is Yours, is something that we kicked off last season. So, last season was our 20th anniversary. We were, you know, like a lot of other theater companies, coming out of like we were in post pandemic, with I think we're still kind of in post pandemic, whatever we want to call this moment. Um, and we were, uh, you know, asking ourselves, what can we do to uh, make theater more accessible to our audiences? Um, of course, that is like the realm that you exist in. And, uh, and you know, we were specifically thinking, okay, well, if, if we're taking like a tiered approach on making tickets accessible to audiences, we already have this ticket subsidy initiative that kind of locks in the amount of money that we will charge for our world premieres, our off-Broadway shows. Um, what if we kind of juiced that up a little bit and tried something that was in the spirit of pay what you can, name your price? Um, I have to name, you know, working theater with their sliding scale model and mixed blood theater with their radical hospitality is a lot of the inspiration for this came from them. Um, but, you know, with a lot of support from our, you know, from the stakeholders inside of the organization, of course, the board has to buy in. Uh, we said, let's take a big swing and try something where all of our shows, all season long, are name your price. Um, there are some, you know, there's some really juicy data in there for the first year that we did name your price ticketing. Our average ticket price was about $19. Um, and just to kind of give you logistically how that, or to give you a sense of how that like worked out, um, we had uh, a $5 ticket, so you ha would have to pay at least $5 for a ticket with a few fees. Um, and then we would offer uh, GA tickets in $5 increments. So you could pay five, you could pay 10, you could pay 15. Didn't matter what you paid, you would still get the same seat as someone that would pay $100, right? Mm -hmm. um, and just to name one of like the challenges of Name Your Price, one of the challenges of creating a ticketing model like this is that CRMs and ticketing companies haven't yet caught up um, to creating like sliding scale ticketing initiatives. So to your point, Tom, like, yes, it is very important that we are uh, making the process as easy as possible and communicating it as, as effectively as possible. Um, this, you know, we were 
that this is my plea to you know ticketing companies like <laughs> let's make it a little easier to make sliding scale um, and name your price ticketing because it's something I, I hope a lot of other institutions look for in the future. Um, we did something a little interesting where we have our you know world premiere off Broadway productions, um, uh, and then we also have we do like a presents like one nighter situation on Fifty Fourth Street. Um, the one night shows, 100% of the ticket revenue that we got from Name Your Price went directly to the artists, like no questions. Like there, we get like the handful of fees attached to each ticket, but the ticket revenue goes to to the artists, period, right? Um, of course, like in any present situation, there is like a guarantee in case, you know, five people show up and they each pay five bucks. But um, what we found is that really incentivized audiences to like not pay the five dollars. Okay, I'm gonna pay, you know, $35 because you know, it's a 99 seat house. This is my really good friend that's you know doing the show. I want to support them financially, aside from just you know attending their performance. So, education was a really big part of that. Um, you know, there's a lot of messaging that we had to kind of do. Uh, we're still we did like a different kind of name your price this season for our off Broadway shows for Prey, specifically where um, the bottom limit would go up ten dollars every week as an incentive to get people to come during previews. Again, kind of fighting that. How do we get people to not wait until the reviews come out to come see the show? Um, and data coming soon, uh, but it's looking really interesting. Um, so very excited to kind of report out that. But in addition to that Name Your Price ticketing initiative, uh, we also have a, a subscription model that's like a little different. It's uh, We have a platform called Ars Nova Supra where you can uh, digitally stream all of our one night shows um, live and on demand. Uh, we set it up a little differently. It was, of course, you know, digital theater was a big part of, I think, a lot of theatrical institutions, like, pandemic moment. Um, luckily for Ars Nova, it was something that had been kind of in the works for a few years leading up to the pandemic, so it was easy to kind of flip on. But um, this season, we're doing uh, Ars Nova Supra, and we did it last season, $15 a month, like, Netflix model. It's not, you know, you can pay $15, $10 for a single ticket and 15 Again, to try to streamline, to try to make sure that we are conveying ideas as you know easily as possible to consumers. Whatever goes in that email, we want it to be less than like ten words so that it like actually like lands to someone. Uh, we're trying to make it really easy. Fifteen dollars, and if you want to cancel your like subscription after you see your friend's show, you can. But if you want to keep it, then hey, you get access to over sixty shows in our library, um, and. We've been seeing a lot of success in that. So talk about like a theater company that's seeing success in a subscription. I mean, I know it is a subscription born out of the pandemic and is more of like a digital focus, but you know, it's in not 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 significant. We've got like 120 super subscribers that are paying $15 a month uh, for a small institution like Ars Nova. That makes a pretty big difference. Um, and you know, we're still kind of in our test kitchen phase where this is. You know the start, and and just to say, a great part about Ars Nova Super as well is the accessibility uh, like possibilities there. You know, we've had ASL interpreted performances by Pro Bono ASL. I remembered it as soon as I was like, wait, that's who it is. <laughs> Pro Bono ASL has done a lot of interpreted performances for us, and we've found a way to you know make sure that we have an interpreter in the bottom corner of the screen for Supra, so that you know individuals can you know experience the show that way. Uh, we're working on captioning services that can help make. You know, our one night performance is more accessible. So I know that was a long, that kind of answered your question and it went back to what Tom was saying. Mm -hmm. But uh, name your price ticketing, trying to make tickets as accessible as possible. We're seeing that like butts are coming, are being sat in seats <laughs> because <laughs> tickets are more accessible. Who would have thought? They're really comfortable seats. <laughs> yes, they're very comfortable yeah. seats. Um, so like we're checking the box of that. Um, we're still learning more about what the revenue implications are, although especially this season, since we implemented this like price goes up ten dollars every week, uh, we've you know I'm going to a board meeting right after this where we're going to report on like the, our findings, and it's very exciting. Um, but in addition to that, name your price ticketing, this like Ars Nova Supra membership model, especially in like a digital lens, is it's it's like working. You know, it's we're again very early phase, but. Uh, we're in like a really exciting moment where yes, we can contain multitudes. We can do the subscription thing, and we can also offer like an accessible, you know, in-person ticketing moment that uh, someone could like engage with in a positive way. So, yeah. great. Um, so as we're nearing the end of our time here together, a couple of uh, so soon, so soon, right? Not yet, oh. not yet. But we're we're just getting there. We're easing our way toward a conclusion. Um, 
I want to offer you an opportunity to, you know, we all may wear many hats professionally, but also personally are whole humans with lives that aren't just about marketing and selling tickets, right? <laughs> um, so uh, I wonder if anybody wants to share something about either a personal artistic practice of yours, another type of practice that isn't about the arts at all, uh, something else about your life and that maybe influences how you think about marketing. Is there something else that you're like, oh, I, I actually bring this to the table. You're, you're smiling because oh, no. you have one. I know you do. <laughs> I'm just a happy person. I know, I know. Uh, I know, I, I enjoy it. Um, you want to start? I'll start. I mean, what the hell? Um, <laughs> I, I mean, my, my personal creative practice is that I'm a musician and I write poetry, but that's not what I'm going to talk about. Um, <laughs> what I was going to talk about is that um, I mentioned in the beginning, um, you know, coming back to kind of like the, the, you know, what impacts like the way we do this work, the way we think about this work. I mentioned in the beginning that I studied social work, and I did that while I was in the middle of my, um, while I was in the middle of my consulting career. After I, I long ago was the head of marketing at Roundabout, and that theater club I worked at, and a few other theaters. Um, but I trained in social work <clears throat> as kind of a mid-career diversion that I now fold into the work that I do now, and um, and it has cha changed my worldview considerably. But one of the things that I reflect on often in my work that I that I really try to make part of my practice is I think about our place in all of this. And when I say our, I mean the large expanse of the arts and culture world um, is, you know, when I was, I was studying clini clinical social work, so I was sitting with clients, you know, talking, you know, providing therapy and counseling services. And as a function of that, I would, I would get to learn their lives and I would ask them about arts and culture. <coughs> I would ask them about, like, what kind of arts and culture exposure do you have in your life? Um, and I heard about a couple, I heard consistently about one thing, going to see their kids, their kids' school, like going to see their kids' mm -hmm. uh, plays at school. But, but every once in a while I would hear, I go to see the, Me the Metropolitan Opera in HD. <laughs> mm. um, and, I, and it really made me sort of, um, it, I, I have to stop and remember those folks in every time I'm doing this work, uh, to work with a, a cultural institution or an arts institution, to think about this re the relevance we're always talking about, and how we can make ourselves essential and how we can make ourselves relevant. Um, for a lot of these folks, you know, getting to see a, a work at a theater is, Unfortunately, a, a once in a lifetime, uh, maybe once a, every couple of years, it's a kind of a special occasion kind of a thing. Um, I guess what I'm what I'm really coming around to is that like my the practice that I have is to remember not to art shame somebody's way into mm -hmm. this business, mm -hmm. not to sort of shame somebody's access point that made them feel like they had an, an opening to come and experience, and that that is usually going to be something that's a little more mainstream. It's usually going to be something that's a little more mass market. Um, I'm just glad they went to that thing. Because that means they might go to one other thing. Mm -hmm. And so I think anybody's success is all of our success because it gives us an opportunity. And it's, uh, it's really been, for me, um, it's changed the way that I look at um, the way that quote unquote competition, and I hate that word for our field, but how that works for all of us. Because we are all, we all are, sink whether you are a one person op operation or a 500 person arts institution, we all rise and fall together. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and so anyway, that, that's, that's sort of what I thought about in, in response to that. Thank you. Yeah. One thing I reflect on a lot is theater can feel like this very insular community, because it is. And I always kind of orient myself that even though I'm a theater marketer, that there's a whole other marketing world. And our average mm -hmm. audience member is exposed to that. And they don't think of us. There's not like the, the breakdown of, well, I'm, I'm experiencing this not-for-profit theater, so I have different <laughs> expectations for them versus like when I'm on Amazon. Like That's not how it works. Mm -hmm. um, People just want the experience that they have, and they don't think of it. They don't like give you an excuse because you are a not-for-profit theater. And I think about that all the time um, to kind of guide me that like we we can't just be thinking about each other. We really need to be thinking about like what is the audience member experiencing, big picture, and how can we align what we're doing with those expectations because they're not making allowances for us. So I kind of always keep that in mind. I guess I'm. So I have a physical disability. And I think as, as I'm either getting older or my disability is getting more kind of prominent, um, it, it is the experience. And I, I reflect a lot on like my experience and my experience, because I go to a lot of theater, um, and how I'm treated. Mm. And, and I, I think that um, you know, every time I go to a Schubert house that doesn't have a bathroom on the level and that I have to stop drinking at noon, it pisses me off to like know, and it changes my experience mm. of that show. Like, like it, 
in such a in such a, a huge way that um, that it changes my whole day and it changes what what the theater experience is and it kind of it it mars it and it you know it doesn't always ruin it but mm -hmm. it it impacts me on the day of the day at the day after and it's it's just become such a, a point of um, what the experience is like and you know having the having that personal experience of what it's like is going to be different for everybody but it's so you know it's it so has kind of changed you know my perception of um, the experience and I, I just keep going back to that word because I think that it's such an important uh, word in what we do, in what we do with the audience that we serve, in, in whatever context, whether it's disability or not disability. But it's, it's that experience. And it, um, it's kind of changed my, you know, whether it's, it's changed my, my experience with other audiences of the same, it's, it's that shared experience. It's that, you know, kind of being with people like me or being not with people like me has really kind of impacted you know my my personal experience of how I identify myself, mm. how I how I portray myself, how I talk about myself, which I think has kind of helped me work with actually a community that I'm not like. So you know, being a hearing person working with deaf people who have kind of embraced me and kind of accepted me after you know forty something years of working <laughs> in the field, but I know I'm different, and I know I will never have the experience of being a deaf person. So it's always had, you know, that, that's always kind of made me feel like an outsider in what I do. But having my own experience has really kind of energized me and empowered me to be able to kind of speak my truth in those kind of situations. Mm -hmm. so. That resonates so hard with me. Yeah. I have seen, like, I couldn't even tell you how many shows I've seen, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And I, like, I, there are some I gen legitimately don't even remember. Like, years later, I'm like, I don't remember seeing that. But I can still recall, I saw The Inheritance in early 2020. It's a six and a half, seven hour show, something like that. And I still vividly can remember that experience. I was seven and a half months pregnant. And those very, very kind ushers were like, whatever bathroom you need, like move seats, whatever. Because um, I had to go to the bathroom every like five seconds. I was seven and a half months pregnant. Um, and I vividly remember that theatrical experience, even though I've seen hundreds of plays, because it was such a good experience in the theater. And I think about that a lot, like how can we make it the best possible experience for our audiences? And there are things like that, you know, Kind Ushers is obviously one of them, but also, you know, when somebody has bought a ticket, a return ticket, that's not their first time with us, can we have that, like when they, we scan our tickets, can that light up, which there is technology that can do this, um, that, the, that whoever's scanning tickets can say like, welcome back, um, or can we leave something at their seats? Can we use AI to kind of help this along? Like there are definitely lots of opportunities to really enhance that experience in person um, and after, you know, sending a follow-up email, serving content after, that is really going to help people become really loyal repeat fans. And to say, like, we can look at neighboring industries. You're so right, Ali, and I say this all the time. I think we can all agree that a lot of our industry's practices at times can be antiquated, or there's there's a lot that we can learn from looking at, like, companies like Disney that are, like, you know, master class experience marketers and, um, and so on. Uh, which do, which do a lot of that. And I know Tessa Tura has some cool stuff. I remember the last conference I went to of theirs, they were kind of talking about this stuff. So, um, but to your point, especially Beth, of like, uh, of being kind of curators of experience as marketers, I'm, I tell this like story that, you know, to my students at Baruch that like, uh, you know, oftentimes as arts marketers, we don't see ourselves as artists, right? I know a lot of arts marketers are like, I'm, I'm the marketing person. I'm not, I'm not the, you know, I'm not making the art. Uh, but I, I challenge that um, and say, you know, uh, when, when you are inside of a theatrical space, there, there are kind of two shows going on. There's the show that is happening on a stage and a curtain comes up and there are actors in that performance and there, you know, someone costumed them and there's a casting director that helped to support it and then the curtain comes down and that show ends, right? But at the same time, there's another show happening and that show is the actors of the audience, right? It is the performance of coming into a space of, of sitting down, of having that conversation with the person next to you, and, uh, and then you're watching the show. Um, and that show never ends. That show does not have a curtain. 
you walk out of that theater space, you have a moment with the person you went with, or maybe you like get into a cab and think about that show, and that show lasts as long as you can hold on to the memory of your experience in that piece. And as marketing directors, we are the casting directors of that show. We, we cast that show. It is our job to make sure that we're communicating to our audiences and welcoming folks into our space. It's also our job in partnership with the rest of the team of the organization to make sure that the, you know, that the actors are cared for. We are also company managers, right? So um, I, I totally agree with you, Beth. I, I think every time that I'm putting together a marketing campaign, it's, there's always a strong consideration of like, what is the audience experience going to look like? Because, you know, I'll say it for the, for the last time, <laughs> they are going to be the marketers for you. I mean, um, they are, if they have a positive experience, then they're gonna go tell a bunch of people, go see The Inheritance because, you know, it's, it's long, but I had a really great time. <laughs> you know, so. Word of mouth is so much more valuable than basically anything. It's like 12 times more valuable than what you say about yourself. Yeah. Um, and what tools can we give our audiences to help that conversation? Like, can the number of shows that I've seen versus the number of post-show emails I have received is really not proportionate at all. And it's, mm. it's very sad to me. I'm the kind of person, maybe this is just me, but when I see something that I'm interested in or that I loved, I want to like go and Google it and look up everything about it after and know like the context and the history and behind the scenes and all that. And can we just hand that to people? Can we send a post-show email with our blog post, which I hope all of you have a blog and are updating it, it's great for SEO. Um, can we just give that to people and send it to them in an email? Can we do behind the scenes peeks, like go grab an iPhone and like take some pictures? When you're teching, can you do, if you, and you have some sort of like cool thing happening on stage, can you just like snap a video of that and send that to people? Do you have a podcast? Right? I really want to subscribe. <laughs> I don't know why this feels yes. so radical to me, but I'm, because I'm like, I'm like, oh yes to all of those things, except I always think about them as pre-show. We're pre-show too, yeah. But, but, I, but it's so interesting because I actually think it's more valuable as I'm hearing you talk about, I'm hearing it as more valuable after the show as a tool for you to say, oh, now I have seen it, now I want to know more, and now I'll forward that email to somebody else. You know, like that's so, it, it seems so simple, and yet I've not Nobody's heard of that. It. Yeah. No. And we should have, like, we should have these things already, because I hope that we have a blog, I hope that we are making content for social that's showing off, you know, behind the scenes and all of that. Right. So it should be as easy as like putting together a triggered email and sending it. It should cost nothing, ideally, but nobody is doing it, and it blows my mind. Do it. Do it. I want do this. It. Make it happen for me. <laughs> I do kind of have a podcast. CI Capacity has a, a, a podcast that I'm on very frequently. It's, it's called CI good. to I, if you want to look it up. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, there was a question about other hats, right? Yeah. I can, I can step into that one. Please. So in addition to uh, my consulting company, Center Arts, I also recently launched a nonprofit based in New York and Mexico City. Uh, it's an international arts exchange program called the Urban X, urbanx.org, for anyone who's there listening. <laughs> uh, but we're specifically focused on connecting black and brown creatives through the lens of urban culture. So it's all about how we dialogue as people of color <coughs> with the cities and the structures around us, mm. and particularly using art as a vehicle for that kind of civic change. Um, and it's our pilot year, and it's super exciting. So in May, we brought six New York-based artists to Mexico City, uh, for a series of micro residencies. And then the boomerang just flew in the opposite direction this September where we brought a group of Mexican artists to New York. Um, and one of the things that's really top of mind for me uh, leading uh, an international company now is language justice. Mm -hmm. What it means to actually uh, have artists and creators, but also audiences, uh, speak and be heard in their language of dominance. Um, you know, I'm blessed that everyone who's a part of our organization uh, has some familiarity or fluency in both English and Spanish. So we speak English, Spanish, Spanglish. We self-translate, you know, we'll o overdub ourselves by repeating ourselves in both languages. Uh, we've had language justice in terms of translators who are able to either uh, translate openly in a different language for the rest of the audience or to be one-on-one -on -one sort of intimate translators, right? And I think uh, that what I would love to see, particularly in this conversation of audience development and arts marketing, is a full embrace of uh, accessibility in terms of language, particularly in a city like New York, particularly in a city that is not only 70% BIPOC, but a full like 25 to 30% uh, Latine or Hispanic. Um, there's a robust, particularly like Spanish theater contingent here, so shout out to all the Spanish language theaters who sometimes may or may not find themselves like frontline in spaces like this. Mm -hmm. So when you think about like 
Pergonis, PRTT, Teatro Latea, like all the different organizations that make up um, a very long standing cultural uh, history within this city. Um, I would love to see more conversation focused on how we <coughs> platform and share out uh, that great work and not just think of it as, you know, separated to the side or only for Spanish speaking audiences. I'll tell you that one of the blessings of my work as a curator who works in both spaces is like seeing an artist have their mind blown by watching something else, whether or not they understand the language, right? <laughs> and so like bringing New York based artists to Mexico City and having them just literally like their, their brains melt watching performance art in Mexico and seeing the same thing with Mexican artists. Like we brought a Mexican artist to go see Prey when we went a couple weeks ago. And you know, regardless of whether or not you're following every word, you get the experience. And so let's believe that our work can transcend those boundaries, but also let's think about different ways uh, to meet folks in their uh, languages of dominance. So, thank you. Anybody else want to talk about any hats, any additional hats that influence your, your work? Let's sneak away. From I don't know. I was literally, I was thinking about it. I was like, what do I do? That's what not do you do? theater. <laughs> <laughs> well, it could be some other other aspect of theater. I well, that's that was part of where I was like, you know, my answer was. Uh, I mean, I, I love rock climbing, so mm. I guess rock climbing is a very it's a uh, indoor rock climbing is a lot of problem solving, and that's something that I really think is interesting and intersectional with kind of mm. my work as a marketing director. I feel like especially at a small institution, there's always a problem to be solved, yeah. um, especially at a place like Ars Nova that takes really big swings, really big, like, like let's, let's pivot because it is the best move for the artists and for the people inside of the institution. Um, I don't know. I don't, I, don't, I don't think I have a good answer except for that you know, sometimes we're, we're, we're making big swings and, and we're trying new things, which is exciting, and having to think. Um, I truly, and I, I have to imagine that a lot of people in different industries say this, but I, I, I truly believe it that the individuals that I collaborate with in my institution and another are like the smartest people in the world. Like I, I because you're, you know, you're applying your passion into something and you, uh, we are constantly trying to make this industry better. Like I, I see that, I see an active effort from everyone that I've ever collaborated with, that they are actively trying to make this industry better, more fair, more, make more sense to more people, you know? Um, or make more sense to that, you know, mile wide, uh, mile deep folks. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, I'll stop before I, I say I have an offering <laughs> as your friend. Can yeah. you talk about the experience you had at Baruch when you invited your twin brother to come and speak? Oh my gosh, yeah, well, Emily helped set that up. <laughs> I, have a, I have an identical twin brother who works in uh, ticketing and marketing for the, for the Miami Dolphins and for the, what's this, what's this, what's this one, Dennis. <laughs> yeah, I literally, I'm like, what's, oh, oh my gosh. Artie might be watching. Uh, Sports uh, ball. Uh, yeah, uh, that, that one. This is <laughs> the stereotype of, of our, our artists. Uh, it was really fascinating. It was really wonderful. And I, I love getting to have conversations with it because, uh, again, like sports, a, a neighboring industry to, like, especially the performing arts, um, mm -hmm. you are, you know, ushering people into a space and they're experiencing mm. something collectively and they walk away with something. Or, or leave with, with something. Um, and it was really, really fascinating. And the students loved it. I have to tell you, Emily, they loved it um, because they got to hear a perspective from someone that is in an ancillary field. Um, sports are also you know, dealing with very similar problems than we are um, on different scales, of course. Um, and they have different uh, tools at their disposal. But uh, it, it was great. And shout out to Freddie, who is with the Miami Open. It is a tennis <laughs> tournament. I get a star for remembering. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. Well, okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, one final question, just to just to close this out. I'm wondering if you um, would each like to share something that you are optimistic about in our field, something that you're looking forward to. Um, what makes you feel optimistic? I can start. Um, I'm excited to see what happens with AI. I mean, it scares me on some level. Like, I'm deeply terrified of AI. My husband works in tech, so like, definitely see the downsides. But I also think there's a lot of upside, especially in our industry. I kind of always remind myself, like, I work predominantly with like Meta and Google, which there are lots and lots of downsides to those companies. But I always remind myself that like, I am pushing out campaigns about theater, which is good, and I'm like using these tools for good. Mm. Um, that's like how I justify it in my head <laughs> that I don't like get really depressed. Um, so similarly, with AI, like there's obviously lots and lots of downsides, but I'm also excited to see how we can use the tools for good to help 
with making our theater and building up our audiences and all of that. Are we going down the uh, If you like, yeah. Sure. What, are you looking forward to? what am I looking forward to? What am I optimistic about? Mm -hmm. I am optimistic about the numbers of companies and organizations who are interested in building their relevance for their communities, right? And so um, whether that's civically based or community based programming, whether that's building like a system and structure within your organization to do the work more often, uh, authentically, I think that there is a real sea change that we're thinking of marketing and of audience development, not as the last piece of the puzzle, but as a core design element to the work, right? Mm -hmm. That um, us marketers and us builders of community have a seat at that table. And so uh, the more I collaborate with folks around the country and around the world, the more excited I am about that. Thanks. Yeah. What am I optimistic about? Um, I'm optimistic about a lot of things, um, shockingly. Uh, I am, a, you know, as I mentioned, we do a lot of things. We do marketing work, we do strategic planning work, we do search work, all those kinds of things. And in all of that work, um, I feel like I get to like harvest people's enthusiasm to be in this field. Um, and to really sort of, you know, fuel myself on it. And I see that, um, you know, there is a lot of press out there about where things are in our field and there's a lot, and there's a lot of struggle in the field. We don't need to tell you all that. Um, but, you know, it wouldn't be, we wouldn't be doing it if we weren't working towards something. And we wouldn't be sort of, you know, going, we, we certain, none of us do this for the money. Uh, you know, we, it's, it's really about sort of what we're working toward. Um, for for our communities, for the world, and I and I get really enthused and excited by the people that continue to want to be a part of that. Um, you know, I talk to people all the time who are looking to who are seeing this field um, in this in the period of strain that it's in and want to come help, and they work in other places and could be making a lot more money, <laughs> but they want to come help and they want to come do this. Um, so that gives me a lot of hope and optimism for our field, and we need them. And I also want to make sure that people get compensated <laughs> appropriately for the work that they do. Um, but yeah, I think this, it's the people, including you all. Um, just kind of piggyback on that. Um, I am optimistic as, a, as an incredibly small organization and kind of single run for many years. Um, I'm, I'm optimistic and pleased about the inclusion of new people to keep us going beyond me and that kind of, it, it's, it's so nice after working so much alone with ancillary people, but having kind of partnership and having people to work with is so much more fun and, yeah. and less stressful and I'm so enjoying it. And so that I'm optimistic about the future. Say I'm optimistic about the kind of access of it all. Like, I mean, I'm op optimistic that like there's there are more conversations happening about inclu inclusion on like an accessibility and like uh, in regards to like deaf and hard of hearing communities and um, access also as it relates to like culturally specific communities that have historically felt unwelcomed in theatrical spaces and in artistic spaces. Um, access as it relates to language. I'm so glad you brought that up because I'm I'm seeing and noticing this like. Uh, programming trend in uh, in kind of uh, artistic departments playing with programming something in a different language, but to your point, not enough for it to just be programming. What would it look like if marketing follow, you know, ma marketing needs to follow suit, right? Mm. Or, or we need to we need to play ball as well. Um, so I, I think there's like an expansion in the way that uh, in, in, in the way that access is happening in our industry that I, I, I see that going in a really positive trend. Um, and I, I hope, I, I feel a lot of pressure because I'm the last one on the end. But that's, yes, yeah, Tom. I, say, I can double it. if you want. I'm like, here. I, I, I will say, I just want to say, I, I, don't, I don't always have to have the last word for the record. But I, I do want to say, like, like, I'm really glad we're all here. I'm really glad, what gives me optimism is that we are all here together. And I don't mean these five people, although I love all these people. But I mean all of us in this room and, and in the sort of greater landscape of the work that we all do. Because every single thing we've talked about today is stuff that we can't solve as one institution or one company or one, one whatever. Um, and, it, and it feels like um, the, the invitation, I guess, in this moment is to, I talked about it before, partnership in, through the lens of like expense reduction, which is an incredibly crass way to talk about it. Mm -hmm. But um, I do think that's kind of, that is going to create so much opportunity if we, if we stop, if we get over this idea of competition and we get, it, get into the idea of exactly what Art New York does and exactly what service organizations exist to do, which is provide a foundation for us all to do the work we need to do without all having to duplicate each other's work. 
<clears throat> to sort of do the, the, the unsexy part. Let's just say it that way. Um, and so that, that makes me really excited. And, and, and coming out of this conversation, that's something that's going to stick with me is that um, you know we we have an opportunity, but only when we because n none of these are, none of our organizations have enough money. Let's just state that. But like we have the, we have an opportunity when we all do it together. So just had to say that. All of your sponsors are heartwarming, and I'm like, yeah, big scary tech. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you talk oh, about AI. Uh, AI wrote everything she said yeah. today. <laughs> I said I wanted to assemble a panelist, a panel of diverse perspectives. Exactly. Really? That's what we have, um, and I really appreciate it. Um, and I really appreciate all of you. Thank you for being here. Thank you all for being here. Thank you all for watching um, online, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Great to be with you. Uh,